Our first speaker today is USFA Deputy Fire Administra uh, Administrator, rather, Dr. Dennis O'Neill. Uh, Dr. O'Neill has won multiple awards for his leadership in roles including leading the US Fire Administration's team at the World Trade Center site, directly following the events of 9-11, and helping the New York City Fire Department re-establish their systems of command, control, and communications. In 2005, he led the training and dispatch of 4,000 firefighters to assist in the response to Hurricane Katrina. An honorably discharged Army veteran, he rose through the ranks from firefighter to acting chief, leading a uniform force of 620 firefighters and officers. He spent his entire time in the street as a line fire officer. It is my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, let their whānau to welcome Dr. Dennis O'Neill. I want to thank you for that very kind invitation, uh, invocation, and uh, I'm kind of impressed at how well you read my mother's handwriting. That was good. Uh, to my friends from New Zealand, Kaora, I want to thank you, FBA President Glenn Williams, CEO Bill Butzbach, uh, Mitchell Brown, and the entire organization for getting me here from the United States. The truth of the matter is I, I almost didn't make it. Uh, you're all in the public service, you're all in the emergency services, and you know how fragile life is. One minute you're here, the next minute you're not. And uh, I almost didn't make it. Last month, uh, my niece had a baby, and my wife and I drew out, drove out to see the baby, take pictures like we all do in our families. Uh, it's my wife's hometown, Allentown, Pennsylvania. So after the uh, event, the baptism and the, and the celebration, we got in the car to drive home, and I needed uh, gas. I, I admit I'm an American, and I speak imperfect English. But uh, we use the term gas instead of petrol. But, uh, so I stopped to get some gas at a big, huge gas station with all the gas pumps. And they have a fast food restaurant inside. And my wife said, I'm going to go in and get some coffee. I said, terrific idea. I fill up the car. I wait a few minutes, and my wife is nowhere to be found. So I walked into the store, and I turned and I looked, and she's standing there talking to this guy, this big guy with a red apron and a hat, and she has her hand on his arm. So I don't say anything. She doesn't have any coffee, so I walk over, and I make the two cups of coffee, and I turn, and, and she's still talking to this guy. So I didn't say anything. I walk up to the cash register. I pay for the coffee. I turn around. She's talking to this guy. And I said, Jan, come on. we got to get going. And she said, OK. And she reaches up, puts her arms around this guy, and gives him a big kiss. So I don't say anything. <laughs> we get in the car. I get out on the highway. We're doing the minimum speed in Pennsylvania, which is 185 kilometers an hour in the slow lane. And I said, what was that all about? She said, what? I said, the guy, the big guy with the apron and the hat. What was that all about? She said, oh, that was Eddie May Carr. Uh, Eddie and I dated in high school. Uh, we were quite an item. As a matter of fact, Eddie took me to the senior prom, the big dance at the end of the high school. She said, and uh, after after uh, Eddie graduated, he, he got drafted into the Army like you did, and he went overseas, and he came back, and he went to work for his uncle, who owned a gas station on that property. And he worked there for a long time, and uh, his uncle decided to sell out to the big oil company. But part of the deal was that Eddie would always have a full-time job in the gas station as long as he wanted, and Eddie is the second assistant night manager of the gas station. So I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> I said, you know, you're pretty lucky you married me. Because <laughs> if you married Eddie, you'd be the wife of the second assistant night manager of a gas station in Allentown, Pennsylvania. She said, if I married Eddie, he'd be deputy fire administrator. <laughs> So 
And Eddie's not that funny. So you wouldn't like him. He was almost here. Uh, I was privileged to watch probably a momentous piece of legislation or a vote yesterday, Democracy in Action, and it's a tribute to you and your organization and your vision for the future uh, that you're going in this direction. And I know it's going to be difficult. And there's probably going to be some bumps in the road and there's going to be some challenges. But this morning, I want to take you from looking at your organization and worrying about the challenges and worrying about what uniform you're going to wear and what color your trucks are going to be and what kind of shoes you're going to buy. Because if you're concentrating internally, sometimes you're not paying attention to what's going on in the world, in the environment. So my purpose this morning is to encourage you to look at the environment, what's happening around you, because you've got to constantly uh, adapt. And you could be the best in the world you are today. We're the New Zealand Fire Service. We're the best brigades. We're the North Island. We're the South Island. You have unit pride. But in fact, you've got to be prepared for the kind of things that we see coming next. And Henry Ford said, if uh, I asked people what they wanted, uh, they would have told me faster horses. Okay? So you go through these technological changes, and I'm going to go through a lot of them with you, in the future fire service here in New Zealand and uh, ask you to be prepared because your success in the future, your success in this organization is gonna be solely dependent upon your preparation for tomorrow. Your experience, your war stories from yesterday aren't gonna cut it because it's not yesterday anymore. Your experience isn't gonna help you because many of the things that we see coming up have never been experienced by anyone before. And finally, this rate of change is happening so quickly that it's almost impossible to stay current. And if you look at your own life, at the changes that you've seen in the music industry and in publishing, if you look at newspapers and the colleges and universities and the changes that they're going through, I can attend a university right here in New Zealand from America and never see the building and ask yourself, when was the last time you actually held a photograph in your hand as opposed to the 10,000 photographs that you have on a hard drive in your computer? And when was the last time you either sent or received a handwritten letter? And when you see the changes that are going around the world, the democracies that are, well, I shouldn't say that, I should say the republics that are dealing with civil unrest, the Arab Spring, probably the first principal reason of that, and the ability of the citizens to communicate amongst themselves around the civil authorities are toppling autocratic governments. And today, if there's a, just a, a slight scintilla of civil unrest in a country, dictatorships, the first thing that they do is shut down the internet so that people can't communicate around the civil authorities. And when we're talking about change, of course, the author, Charles Darwin, the scientist, came up, and, and he wrote a book on the origin of the species. And a lot of people attribute the statement to him that only the fit survive, only the strongest survive. But Darwin never said that. What Darwin said, it's not the strongest nor the most intelligent. It's the one most responsive to change. And that's what you're going to be going through over the next number of years. Now, when the environment changed, if you, are there any paleontologists in the audience? No? Okay. Well, there are. I, I figured I'd get one, yeah. When the environment changed, alligators continued to adapt. Dinosaurs didn't. Alligators and dinosaurs lived at the same time in history in our world. But the dinosaurs died off, and everyone thinks that they died off because they were old or something. I, that's not true. The truth of the matter is, is that the alligators changed and adapted, and the dinosaurs didn't. When the environment changed, the dinosaurs didn't change with it, and they died off. So if you don't like change, you're going to hate extinction, <laughs> because that's what happens to, to organizations. And I'm going to point out a few big organizations and the people that thought that they were the best, that they 
they knew everything and we're so big and we're so proud and we're the best. And I hear it sometimes in fire departments where I go. So I just want to tell you that none of us are invincible. We need to continue to adapt. In the United States, they have not built an enclosed mall since 2006. Okay, the last one was 2006. They're, they've resurrected two of them in the United States, but they were, they started to build them, they went bankrupt, and now they're restarting to build them. And a report by Credit Suisse estimates that 20 to 25 percent of enclosed malls will close over the next five years. And you ask yourself why. And what happens is when the big stores close, they take the smaller stores with them. And in 2017, 6,400 stores in the United States closed. And in 2018, they're estimating at about 12,000 stores. They're just closing right and left. Why? Amazon. Putting everybody out of business. Why are these stores closing? They're not adapting to the environment. And if you look at the Amazon process, where you want to purchase a product, you go online, you look at their products catalog, you click on some item that you want, you put it in your cart, you pay for it with your credit card, and your package arrives at home, sometimes in days. So the thing is, is that the company that invented that ma mail order business is Sears Roebuck. And Sears Roebuck invented the mail order business 130 years ago. But when the environment changed, when the internet came, Sears said, we're Sears. We're the biggest. We're the best. We have stores all over the world. People aren't going to shop on the internet. They're going to come to our stores. They want to touch the merchandise before they buy it. They want to try on a shirt or a pair of pants or a jacket before they buy it. We don't have to change. Another company, IBM, invented the commercial computer around the world. They were big blue. They, they controlled the computer industry for the entire 40 years. And when the PC came out, their response to the PC was, it's a toy. Nobody's going to buy that. Nobody can operate it. We know what we're doing. We're IBM. We're in control. Another company called Xerox. They invented the copier. But they didn't adapt to the printer industry because they didn't understand one basic fact. There is no such thing as a printer industry. I can go to a store right over here and buy a printer for maybe $150 New Zealand money. When I bring that box home, I'll plug the computer in, put the ink in, and the computer's going to work. In three months, I'm going to run out of ink. How much is the ink going to cost? $150 New Zealand. They never figured out that they were following the model developed by a man named King Gillette and King Gillette said, give them the razor, sell them the blades. Printer companies are giving away printers because they're going to be selling ink, and they know they're going to be selling ink, and it's going to be a continuous sale. Eventually, they know the computer's going to clog up, and you'll have to buy a new one, but they're not interested in selling you a printer. They want to make sure you're buying the ink. And the big question is, what company controlled the entire photography industry for the 20th century. Kodak. They had control of the paper, the film, the processing, the cameras, everything. They were Kodak. They even had a song, Kodachrome. At one time, Kodak had a 100-person full-time career fire department on their property. And now they're essentially bankrupt. 
Kodak invented, everyone thinks that they went out of business because of digital photography, but that's not true because Kodak invented digital photography. Kodak built the first digital camera. Digital, uh, Kodak controlled how that digital image was stored, the, the format of the storing of the digital images. That's all Kodak. And then when they went bankrupt, the only income they had was selling their rights to digital photography to the phone companies. So your phone that has so many X millions of pixels in it, that's all Kodak technology. They also tried to build a printer industry, but again, Kodak didn't understand that there's no such thing as a printer industry. It's an ink industry. So my point to you this morning is that if you think that the fire and emergency services here in New Zealand don't have to adapt to the environment, you're on your way to becoming a dinosaur. You need to learn from Sears and IBM and Xerox and Kodak and pay attention to how your environment is changing. And ask yourselves over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, how does this organization plan to adapt? And I'm going to go through uh, some changes that we see coming up around the world uh, in the fire and emergency services. But uh, every once in a while, you're going to see my buddy here, the alligator. So, uh, so pay attention. It's a reminder to you of the things that you have to consider adapting to. The easy stuff is the technological stuff. We love it. We pay attention to it. We know what kind of trucks these are. We know how much water they hold. We know how much pressure they can produce at a fire. We know how fast they can go. We know where all the equipment is stored. That's, that's the easy stuff. With firefighters, we love that stuff. Uh, but we're dealing with buildings, and buildings are going through changes. The methods and the materials of construction are different today than they were 20 years ago, 30 years ago. This is an example of a building that's getting reused. At the one time, this was a school, and now they're converting it to a senior citizen residence. And when this building was built, when it was a school that had a flat roof, and everyone knows that flat roofs leak, so the first thing they want to do is put a new roof on an old building. Now, you're not going to see this building at 2 o'clock in the afternoon when the sun is shining and, and there's no clouds in the sky. You're going to see this building when it's full of smoke and flame, and it's going to be 2 o'clock in the morning. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, you're going to take a look at this roof and think that it's a, you not realize that it's a new roof on an old building. You're going to think that it's an original roof. You're going to think that there are joists supporting that roof, solid wood members, but in fact, it's a truss roof. And the whole roof is glued together and assembled on the site. Now, glue fails at about 135 degrees. That thing's coming down like a ton of bricks. But at 2 o'clock in the morning, you don't realize that change is going on in your neighborhood. This is an example. I'm going to show a video of a new residence construction. It's going to be on fire. And what we're seeing in America, and I know you're seeing it here in New Zealand as well, is that the products that they're putting in homes today are plastic. They're hydrocarbon fuels. They're not carbohydrate fuels. They're hydrocarbon fuels. And the BTU, the heat release rate, is much greater than the ordinary combustible materials. As a matter of fact, it's twice as, twice as much. And um, this is an example of a truss-supported roof, uh, a truss-supported building, really. Floors and ceilings and roofs. Um, well, you'll see it. Watch for backdraft. The whole front of that house came off like that. Every, any one of you pulled up to that fire at 2 o'clock in the morning or 1 o'clock in the afternoon, it didn't matter. 
you knew what to do. You'd never anticipate that rapid acceleration of fire because of the plastics in the house. And then the house, the fact that the house is glued together and it cannot withstand that kind of an explosion internally. Another change in the United States is the construction of buildings out of something called cross-laminated timber. I, don't, I know that there's a tremendous timber industry here in New Zealand. I'm not sure that this has come here yet. Does anybody can help me out? It has, okay. So cross-laminated timber is essentially scraps of wood glued together under pressure and in making dimensional lumber out of it. This is a building going up in my home state, New Jersey, Newark, New Jersey, a 500,000 square foot building on a mixed use development. The codes in the United States now allow up to 18 story buildings made out of wood. Now, you can do the math on this thing. You know what the fire loads are. You, you can express your concerns about that. My concern isn't just the fire load. My concern is the structural integrity. When the wood gets wet and then it dries, and then it gets wet and it dries, and it gets wet and it dries like a flooded basement or perhaps a toilet, a pipe that's going down, a waste pipe that's leaking a little bit and it just continually exposes that wood to moisture. What happens? What happens to the structural integrity uh, of the wood? This is uh, a video of a building that's being constructed in Florida. I think it's built now. And they're using something called glass fiber reinforced concrete. I'm not sure how this burns or not burns. You can see the video and you'll see what uh, my concern is. February 2016, 15 months since ground was broken and Miami's newest landmark is rising out of the ground. Construction on the Scorpion Tower has reached the seventh floor, and Zaha Hadid's twisting inside-out support columns are starting to take shape. This is the, the first lift of columns that takes off right off the mat. This is where it starts, and curves start right at the bottom. So far, the columns have been shaped by pouring concrete into plywood-lined forms but even the best finish is far from smooth. That's a problem because this skyscraper is defined by its silky curves. So from the 15th floor, where the columns slim down, the exoskeleton will be formed using a groundbreaking construction material. Known as glass fiber reinforced concrete, or GFRC, it's normally used as a decorative cover but here, pre-made panels will be used as permanent formwork to deliver the building's signature curves. So what's glass, fiber, reinforced concrete? Is it combustible? Are we putting a coating on that building that's combustible? Does that sound familiar? Now, Everyone knows about Grenfell Tower, the tragedy in London. But some of you may or may not know the story in Dubai. They have a high-rise building with the same problem. The exterior is combustible. And they've had two high-rise fires in this building where the fire goes up the entire side of the high-rise. And the only thing saving the high-rise is that those particular high-rises are protected by sprinklers. And in the Grenfell Tower, Grenfell Fire, there were no sprinklers inside. I, you can't make this stuff up, folks. The name of the building, does anyone know? It's called the Torch. You can look it up. So we're really, our methods and materials of construction are not taking into consideration the consequences of a fire uh, out of control. So that's about the methods and materials of construction. I'm going to shift new technology. Uh, this is a church, and the pastor or the vicar of the church has now put solar panels on the church. What do you figure the chances are 
that the vicar or the priest or the rabbi or the minister took the time or paid the price to have an engineer to come in and figure out the weight of that roof, the way that equipment on the roof? Yeah, the answer is no chance. I don't know about New Zealand English, but in, in America we have a term, we call it a slim chance or a fat chance, okay? They mean the same thing. It isn't going to happen. Now, energy conservation, energy or electric generation is becoming very popular uh, in the United States. People are putting these solar panels on their roofs of their homes. Uh, there's two technologies. One is solar, the other is photo, vo photovoltaic. Now, I'll explain the two differences in a minute. But uh, my brother is a, a retired police lieutenant uh, from the Jersey City Police Department, where I was on the fire department. Uh, my brother has all the qualifications to be a police lieutenant in Jersey City. That's a, a third grade education, a mustache, and a gun. My, uh, my brother reminds me, as often as he can, that firefighters sleep until they're hungry and eat until they're sleepy. <laughs> I remind my brother, the police officer, that police officers are merely historians with guns. Okay, uh, when was your car stolen, sir? Uh, how much jewelry was taken, ma'am? You know, we're filling out the report here. Uh, so we have that bannering back and forth constantly. But my brother, uh, installed solar panels on his house, and he's an ideal candidate. He and his wife work. Their boys are all raised. They're out of the house. So during the daytime, he generates electricity, and it goes back to the electric company. That's the solar technology. He sells it back to the electric company. And uh, like every partnership and every marriage, we all have jobs, right? You all have jobs in your relationships. My job is fleet manager, groundskeeper, and finance director in my house. That's where you're supposed to laugh. Sorry. <laughs> my brother and his wife, he's the fleet manager and the groundskeeper, but she is the finance director. So after about six months, my brother says to his wife, Ann, uh, we've been selling electricity back to the electric company. We use electricity. I, do you know, where are we with our electric bill? How much has our bill gone down since we put these solar panels on the roof? And Ann said, I, I don't know, Brian. We just pay the budget amount every month. I just pay it. So my brother called the electric company. And he said to them, would you do me a favor? Would you send me, send somebody here to read my meter and send me an actual bill? And they did. This is my brother's electric bill from the electric company in New Jersey. You see down here that the electric company owes my brother $525 for all the electricity he's generating. So my brother, being a wise guy, cop, he sends them a letter. He said, either you remit payment in 30 days or I'm going to cut you off. <laughs> But people are waking up to this. They're generating electricity kind of all over the place. But the new technology called photovoltaic, we're not selling the electricity back to the electric company. They're storing it on the property in batteries. Have any of you seen the battery energy storage system issues yet in your country? OK, a couple. They're putting them in commercial buildings. Typically, if it's a high-rise building, they'll put the battery banks on the third floor because, first of all, it keeps them out of water if there's a flood. But secondly, because if they have to be replaced, it's the heavy lifting, you know, the cranes that they need and the equipment that they need to move the batteries in and out. Is, it's a lot cheaper to do it at the third floor than the 50th floor. But they're also putting these batteries in homes. And now you can have photovoltaic put on the roof of your house and store the battery uh, energy in your house in something called lithium ion batteries. Now, lithium ion batteries, we all know, are they go on fire. Can't put them out. I came to New Zealand 
on a Boeing 787 Dreamliner. It's a beautiful plane, but when they built them, the problem that they had, and they didn't realize it until they started burning, was that the lithium ion batteries in the plane go on fire. There's constant charging and discharging. So what the Boeing company decided to do was to wrap the batteries in a titanium vault on the plane. But these, pla these batteries are all over the place. This is a video, it's a time-lapse video, of a lithium ion battery from a cell phone. You're going to see it, it's in a recycling plant. Okay, here we go. as we like to say in America, how did that work out for you? <laughs> that was a cell phone fire in a recycling plant. What are you gonna do if there's a high rise building with a bank of those batteries or a house with a bank of batteries along the wall? Okay, uh, this, that's the, the new technology, the, the lithium ion battery technology. Uh, this is another distribution warehouse fire. This fire occurred about five years ago. It may look familiar to some of you, uh, when I go through what went on at this fire. This is a, a company called the Dietz and Watson Warehouse, and their warehouse is, had, had 7,000 solar panels on the roof. This is a 300,000 square foot building at 7,800 square meters. The acres and the hectares, it's all there for you for the translation. Uh, it was a $300 million building, and there was $700 million worth of frozen turkey breasts and sliced sandwich meats in the warehouse. The fire occurred on the roof, and uh, the solar panels are on the top of the roof. That's what you're looking at. There was a rubber plastic membrane to keep the rain out to protect the roof. Underneath that, it was a truss roof. And then finally, below the truss roof is the sprinkler head. There was a short in one of the solar panels and it set the membrane on fire. The building was something called a tilt panel construction. That's where they bring in pre-stressed concrete, a crane picks it up, they put it up like this, they tie it all together with steel beams, steel columns, and you all know that steel fails at about 13, 1400 degrees. It starts to deform and twist. That is an important part of the fire that you're going to see. So this is the... Uh... Chris, never in my life. This fire is unreal. The fire is simply enormous. Just to put it in perspective, to give you an idea, the Deaton Watson Distribution Center here is the size of five football fields. Now, this is as close as they'll let us get just across the street, but we have two crews here. I'm gonna take you to right across the street, photographer Ryan Iacone standing near the fence. At four o'clock, it did seem like crews had the upper hand or control of this fire, but just a short while ago, we could feel the heat coming through the fence. Then there were a series of at least two explosions and one of the walls fell down. You're going to see that. Take a look. It's just an intense fire. It's just going to take time. We have no idea what it's going to do. 
Crews are still trying to get the upper hand on flames burning underneath plumes of dense black smoke that shot into the sky above Delanco, visible clear across the Delaware River into Philadelphia. We're told nothing inside the 300,000 square foot Dietz and Watson distribution center is actually burning. Instead, it's insulation between the roof trusses and solar panel roof that continues to burn. The problem we have with this fire is the whole top of the roof has solar panels on it. So we can't get on it because they're energized. Neighbor Sandy Iwanicki initially thought a plane crashed. It looked to me like the kind of scene that you would see if a plane crashed. The black smoke was billowing and immense. It was just amazing. Delanco Fire Chief Ron Holt says they are using foam and pulling from three water sources, including the nearby Rancocas Creek, after some nearby hydrants were dry. He says it's too dangerous to put fire crews inside for an interior attack. The hazard right now that I'm worried about is all the water on the roof, whether I'm going to have a structural collapse. And watch to the right of your screen. That's exactly what happened moments before we hit air. Meantime, some residents are nervous about the air they are breathing with so much smoke billowing into the sky. My son was talking about refrigeration and mentioned the ammonia and the chemicals and whatever, and we live three houses away, so I, I am a little leery of what's this mean. And it's important to note that no firefighters were injured or otherwise no one was... Okay, uh, look familiar? I was reading your newspapers for a fire that you had in Auckland not too long ago. Same kind of situation. The only difference was that there were no solar panels on the roof. Um, these are the technological changes that you as a fire brigade, you as a fire service in New Zealand, are going to be dealing with. And you need to be paying attention on your whatever techniques or, or things that you call your pre-fire inspections or your pre-fire planning uh, to make sure that you understand what you're dealing with that if there's battery energy storage systems, if there's solar panels, there's photovoltaic uh, electricity generation on your buildings, uh, you need to be prepared to deal with that. So the next, I'm changing again, okay? This is a, a new section. Uh, I, I love this slide. It's a, uh, a, from a friend of mine named Gary Gruby. There's two, slide, two dots here. Uh, Gary is the uh, senior fellow at Motorola he invented, he has 127 patents uh, for technologies, communication technologies for Motorola. So they named him a senior fellow. And I said, Gary, what does a senior fellow do? What's your, he said, I just sit around and think great thoughts like the Wizard of Oz, you know. And Motorola makes a lot of money on me. So uh, they just give him a desk and an office and a phone and a computer, and he can just sit around and think all day. But he lent me this slide. It's a great slide. It makes a point. Um, about the future that you're going to be dealing with. And the dot on the left is blinking kind of slow. And that dot on the left represents the world's population. is increasing by four babies a second. So you take all the people in the world that are born in one second, you subtract all the people in the world that die in one second, the answer is four. So when you can go home and tell everybody that you know the answer. Uh, the dot on the right is blinking kind of fast. They sell 25 mobile phones a second in the world. Okay? Not only do they sell 25, they continue to produce new mobile phones to convince you that your old mobile phone is useless. Okay? I don't know. I mean, they're used to make phone calls, and you can get on the Internet and send email and text, but I don't know why you need the new phone, but somehow they managed to convince us that we need to get the latest and the greatest cell phone. But it creates a problem for our fire and emergency services because it creates a problem actually for all of society. It has changed all of society because you are on camera, in the United States at least, we estimate between 20 and 25 times a day. You go to a gas station, remember gas, petrol? Okay. You go to a gas station, a petrol station, you're on video camera. You go to an ATM at a bank, you're on camera. You drive down the street, you're on camera. You go to a food store, you're in the bank, you're on camera. You go to a department store, you're on camera. My favorite story, a friend of mine who shall remain anonymous and his fire department will remain anonymous. It's a big city. And if you go to that city, 
and you watch the television, they have commercials. In the United States, we can sue. I'm sure you're familiar with that. We're a very litigious society. And this man has a commercial on, you're in an accident, you call me, I'm the hammer, I'll sue them, I'll get every nickel you deserve. You just call the hammer. 1-800-HAMMER, we'll sue them. We'll get them every nickel you deserve. Every two minutes, he's on a commercial television. Well, one day, the hammer is driving through the downtown section of the city in his brand-new Bentley convertible. And he gets T-boned by a fire truck blowing the red light, and it's on video. So I called my friend to console him. You know, I know you're having a tough time, but would you send me a picture of the Bentley? <laughs> uh, he didn't, OK. Uh, this is a speeding ticket. This is my wife's car, actually. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, I was doing. Uh, Oh, she was doing 48 and a 35, and this is how this letter reads. It says, Dear Mr. O'Neill, we, we spotted your car speeding, and you have a choice. You can pay us $40 to so treat it like a parking ticket because we don't know who is driving the car. Or if you feel that we are being unjust, you can appear in court before a magistrate and plead your case. If you're successful, no charges. If you're not successful, it's a $300 fine, $50 court costs, and we put a penalty on your license that will increase your insurance when we win. Here's your $40. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I said to my wife, Jan, uh, you were speeding. And she looked at it and looked at the date. She said, no, you dope. You were driving. We were going to Washington. You were driving, I remember. So anyway, the point is this that you've got to live your life, you've got to live your job, you've got to live your responsibilities as if you're on camera 24-7, 365. Now, we have court cases uh, very similar to, I'm sure, here, your inquiries. Uh, I'm going to show you just two quick pictures of situations that you would have to respond to. Uh, this is a fire in a garage. There's two officers in the front there. What do you think those two officers are reporting? They're reporting that the fire's in the back of the garage, and we've got it under control. All we, we need is one line. I don't care if you remember anything I've said today. You remember this. When the people inside the building are telling you something different then you're seeing from the outside of the building that's your message from whatever you believe in to get them out of that building immediately. Do not pass go, do not collect $200 immediately. And I'm gonna say it again because it's important. When the people inside the building are reporting something different than you're seeing from the outside of the building, get them out, period. This is another picture. I'm sure you've seen this. How long do you think it's going to be before the driver misjudges the turn and whacks a telephone pole with that bucket? Those kids aren't wearing belts. Or they hit a, a power line and get electrocuted. Okay? And in the United States, this may or may not apply to you. I'm not sure of the liability laws here in New Zealand. But everything you do is subject to pu public scrutiny. Every fire and emergency that you're at, from a road traffic accident to a building collapse, whatever, there's a 10-year-old out there with a camera taking a video of you and your organization responding to that event. And you better have, pictures are worth a thousand words, and you better have an explanation. We have in the United States, I call them the Feasance triplets, Miss Mal and Non. Misfeasance, you knew what to do, you tried to do it, you made a mistake. Nonfeasance, you knew what to do, you were trained to do it, you just didn't do it. You saw that fire truck driving too quick, too fast, and you didn't say anything, you didn't stop them. You saw that firefighter going into a building without a breathing apparatus on, and you didn't say anything. 
you can be charged with that. And of course, malfeasance, you knew what to do, you were trained to do it, you just didn't do it the right way. Change, new, diff, new, new piece here, okay? And that is the next generation coming up, okay? You may have seen this quote in the newspaper, it was in about three weeks ago, it said that children today are impossible. They ignore their parents, they tyrannize their teachers, they gobble their food. Sound familiar about these kids coming up today? You know who said that? Socrates, about 2,500 years ago. No one thinks the next generation is gonna make it. Your parents didn't think you were gonna make it. Their grand your grandparents didn't think your parents were gonna make it, but we do. There are people in this audience right now that think your new organization isn't gonna make it. It will, it will. And this is what you think your fire service is like, what it should be. That's who we should be bringing into our organization, but this is what you think it's becoming. I'll give you a minute, you can look. Um, I'm not sure if they're over here, but the Rolling Stones, um, they're on a 2019 concert tour, world tour. Their opening song, the line in it is, kids are different today, we hear every mother say. Uh, they've been singing that song for 50 years, okay? It's called Mother's Little Helper, and they started singing that song 50 years ago, all right? No one thinks the next generation uh, is gonna make it. This is what you need to realize, that they don't have, I know that there's a bunch of folks out there making a million bucks talking about the generations, the millennials, the Gen Xs, the Gen Ys, the boomers, all that stuff, I got a hot flash for you folks, I don't buy it. What they're talking about is levels of experience and maturity. They're not talking about the decade you were born in. The decade you were born, predicting people's behavior based on the decade that they were born in is about as accurate as you saying, I was born in December, so I'm a Capricorn, and I'm gonna behave a certain way for the rest of my life. You're putting a prejudice on people because of their age, and when in fact, what you're dealing with are levels of experience and maturity that you didn't have 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. That somebody came into your life and changed you, put their arm around you and said, this is how you do it. And you can't compare yourself today to that new person coming in to the organization. I'd like to make a point. Ask yourself, about how old were you when you can remember something? Your first day at school, going on vacation with your family? Anyone? Five, six years old, thereabouts? Okay, you can remember back something happened? Today, the average 24-year-old has no concept of 9-11. It's ancient history. 9-11 is a story that their parents tell them. It's about as relevant to them as the Peloponnesian War is to you, okay? They need to be led. They need to be brought into the organization. They need to be encouraged. They need to be shown. They need to be helped. So what can you expect from this new generation? Well, expect that they're always going to be different. The new men and women coming in are going to be different from you, and that's probably a good thing. There's no magic bullet, there's no simple app, and there's no GPS to get there. And the average 20-year-old thinks that there is. They wanna know what buttons do I have to push in and hit go, and I become the chief fire officer of this brigade or this country. And it's simply not the way the world works. That's not the way society works. But you, as a leader in your organization, you're gonna to have to go to them. You need to meet them more than halfway. You need to bring them up and encourage them and show them and help them to make this organization even better than you found it. Because they are gonna take it from you one day and make it even better than it is today. Change, new topic, data. 
We're very concerned about the elected and appointed city officials who understand data, data analysis, statistics, uh, of course, and the fire service leaders who don't, okay? They hate paperwork. There's only one thing that firefighters hate more than paperwork. Anyone want to hazard a guess? So I heard somebody say change. That's only half the story. Firefighters hate change, and they hate the way things are. That's, there's two sides to that. Yeah, there's only one thing they hate more than paperwork. That's a cash bar. The threats that you're going to face as an organization um, is a citizen who's got a grudge, who's going to constantly seek out your organizational weaknesses, the disgruntled employee who knows all of your dirty little data secrets and your weaknesses in the data, the local newspaper reporter who's trying to win a Pulitzer Prize based on what they report about the fire department, and your local response data is as important to you for data and analysis, it's either your strongest defense or your biggest weakness. You decide. The United States Fire Administration collects data on all of the fire incidents in the United States. One part of our, my organiza our organization, we collect 28 million incidents a year. Fewer than 5% of fires. It's a little over 4% of fires. And the rest are all kinds of emergencies, from windblown signs to people have car accidents to heart attacks, all, everything. They handle everything. When the police department doesn't know who to call, they call the fire department. Ask my brother. <laughs> but the data are critical to your success in the future. This is a story about a friend of mine. His name is Adam Teal. Adam is the commissioner of the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania Fire Department. He's a graduate of our National Fire Academy, and he was also on our National Fire Academy Board of Visitors. He had a situation where they were not doing the paperwork. They weren't counting what they were doing. And when Adam got in, he realized what was going on. So he trained his officers and he told them all, there's about 1,500 officers, the fire department's somewhere around four or 5,000 firefighters. And he said, you will count everything. You will count everything. So the newspaper, the Philadelphia Inquirer, was not, this was not a friendly story, but they said in the quote, they said, it's unclear if the commissioner's directive to count everything according to a standard has led to more funding. But here's what happened in, short, in about three, three and a half years. The budget's grown 28% to $333 million. The city council and mayor has given him an extra $80 million to more or less do what he needs to do. He's hired more than 600 firefighters and 66 paramedics since, 19, uh, since 2016. And he reopened five engine companies, two ladder companies, and two battalions using data. The point is this. If you think you're going to go before a city council, if you're going to present your case to the mothers and fathers who are elected to run your municipalities, if you think you're going to tell them, oh, babies are going to die if you don't, you don't have a grasp of reality. That story doesn't cut it anymore. Give me the numbers. Tell me the truth. Show me. Make your case. The critical person, the critical element on this whole thing is the person doing the data entry. If they fudge the data, you can't be correct. We're going to another change. And this is what's going on in America with regard to our term for it is integrated community risk reduction or integrated risk management. You have a different word for it. As I said, we, I'm speaking imperfect English here, so change the words as you need to change them. But around the world, this is what's going on. In the United States, there's our alligator buddy there indicating change. Uh, we went through a series of evolutions in our organizations and fire department responses from 1947 right up until the present day. And our National Fire Academy is teaching 
what we call whole community integrated risk management, but it's the same as what you're doing here. And the benefits that we see and we have seen for the community is, first of all, many of the things that the previous speakers spoke about, okay? Stakeholder engagement. They're the ones identifying the risks. They become community issues, not fire department issues. And in America, because we're a kind of a big country, there's a lot of different things going on. In Florida, they may be dealing with hurricanes and pool drownings. In California, they may be dealing with earthquakes and wildland fires. Each community has different risks, and that's how you engage the community in identifying those risks and reducing them. There's increased citizen responsibility. They understand that they're kind of responsible for their own well-being, that the fire department isn't going to be able to save 10,000 people at the same time. You had an earthquake here in, in Christchurch, and they couldn't respond to everybody all at once. There's going to be, once citizens understand what the issue is, they're going to support the community and the government to invest resources to help you deal with those risks. And as a result, you're going to have safer and more resilient communities. And that's what we're all after. That's what fire departments in the United States are doing. That's what I'm so happy to hear uh, that you're doing here in New Zealand. For the fire service, for the people who don't think that this is important, that they don't see the benefit, well, you're integrating prevention and response. You're integrating mitigation, prevention, and response. Readiness, all of those kinds of things are all melded together. It's, into, it's, it's seamless throughout the organization. It becomes everybody's job, and your return on investment is stronger municipal support, stronger public support. When they know you, when they've talked to you, when you have listened to them, they like you. Otherwise, you're those people in that building over there with the fire trucks. I don't know what color you're going to. I've seen a lot of colors over the last couple of days, so I'm not going to pick a color. I know I'll be in trouble if I do. And, of course, to your firefighters, there's less risk, there's less exposure, and they're more resilient. They're taking care of their families as well. But it doesn't, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen because you're the good guys and gals. It's going to happen because you're going to have organizations that are led by people who have vision, who understand how to change, or how to management change. They have the political acumen to negotiate all of the different hurdles, just like you did in reorganizing and establishing a new constitution for the UFPA. It takes time to negotiate all of that. It takes patience. It takes tenacity. Now, I've given, or I've, the UFPA folks, Amy, was Amy? She did a great job. But she printed up a handout to you, which gives you a, a road map that we're using in the United States. It may not work here in New Zealand, but it kind of breaks down all of the elements from getting ready all the way through to measuring results and how you do that. And to the extent that you can use it, this is a freebie, help yourself. You want to cross it out, change it, move it around. I'll send you the slide. Amy has the slide. We can do that. You can do that for yourselves. And um, it can happen. You have to have a, a comprehensive risk assessment. You've got to educate internally and externally what this whole community integrated risk management process is. Pick a model, whatever it is. Evaluate, adjust, communicate it, and finally, when you're successful or even the small successes, uh, celebrate success. So this is the United States Fire Administration property, our National Fire Academy, where I work. Um, and my question to you as I close is, what do you think the brigade will be facing five years from now and 10 years from now? What skills will a fire officer five years from now and 10 years from now need? And what will the new recruit class five years from now and 10 years from now going to do well, and what are they going to help, need help doing? So the question this morning is, what future fire service uh, are you going to prepare? 
<laughs> I want to close with a story. You're sitting in the audience and you're saying to yourself, you can't, I can't do this. O'Neill's talking through his hat. So I want to close with a story about the difference that one person can make in somebody else's life. Now today, the media take great effort to combine the, the, the warrior and the warrior to make sure that the men and women who defend democracy in our name deserve our support. And whether you agree with our government or disagree with our government about our policies or foreign policies, that the men and women who are in the military always deserve our support. But it wasn't always so. In the late 60s and early 70s, the media combined the soldiers and the warrior, I'm sorry, the wars and the warriors, and the soldiers in many cases were blamed for the policies of the government. And there's a story about a soldier who came home from overseas and, and went up to his local college to sign up for school. And this is a period at the college called Ad Drop. You took one week of a class. The professor was very difficult. You went back down to the admissions office. You're looking for an easy A, you know, like art appreciation or literature or something that you can get an A in, pull up your average. And it was a big room, probably half the size of this place. And there were kids all waving pieces of paper. There were no computers. And, and there was a mob scene. There was no lines. There was no cues. And the kids would work their way up to the front desk, and there were six people at the desk taking one of the students at a time checking the paperwork to make sure it was perfect. And if the, if the class was open, they'd put them in the class. But if the class was full, they couldn't get into the class and they had to take the hard professor in the hard class. So the soldier was watching all of this and he kind of worked his way up to the front of the room. And a middle-aged guy named Walter turned around and he said, what do you want, kid? And the soldier said, I want to sign up for school. And Walter said, you can't sign up for school now. The admissions is already closed. This is air drop. We're in the process already. And Walter said, did you sign up? Did you apply to come to school here? And the soldier said, no. He said, did you take your examinations to get into this school? And the soldier said, no. He said, I'm sorry, kid. You should have done this months ago. And the soldier said, well, I couldn't. I was in the Army. I was overseas. And I just came home. And Walter said, when did you come home? And the soldier said, I came home three days ago. And Walter turned around, he took a piece of paper, he handed it to the soldier, he said, here you go, kid, fill it out. Take whatever class you want, I'll approve it. And the soldier said, I've never been to college. I, I, I don't know what to take. Walter said, give me the form. I'll fill it out. These are all the best professors in the college, the popular professors. This will be a great experience for you. He said, the classes are all closed. Nobody can get into these classes, but I'm going to prove it for you. And Walter filled out the form, and he signed it. And the soldier at that time gave him a, pay, a check, and he started school the next day. And now you all know how I got into college <laughs> without ever taking a test or applying. It was the kindness of one person on a really bad day at work it took two extra minutes to help somebody. And I often wonder what my life would have been like if I had gotten somebody else at the desk that night. And about 15 years later, I met Walter at a party. And I told him the story. And Walter said, I don't remember you, Dennis. And I said, Walter, I never, I never forgot you. As a matter of fact, I might be in a gas station in Allentown, Pennsylvania right now. <laughs> You can have that kind of event. You can make that kind of change in other people's lives. So I'm going to ask you this morning to be a Walter. Would you do that for me? Thank you. <laughs>